from the Lord, we're going to jump to Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 11, is where we will spend our time this morning, Deuteronomy chapter number 11, as we begin to think a little bit about uh, the many ways in which we are being called to free our fathers and to make every effort to produce a space and a season and a life of liberation. Many of you may remember several, uh, I guess it was a few weeks, but about a month ago when we had our Mother's Day service, there was a national effort to bail out mothers. And uh, I believe uh, over $700,000 were raised uh, to bail out mothers. I think almost, oh man, I don't want to lie, amen. But it was thousands of mothers that were bailed out all across the country uh, because of our gen generosity and our giving, amen. And, uh, and, and similarly, uh, there is and has been an effort to replicate some of that this week and uh, the weeks following to help bail out many of our fathers who are in jails uh, because of their inability to afford bail. And, uh, and so uh, I was thinking, uh, certainly, uh, as some of these efforts are, were, were bubbling up this week, and certainly as uh, we uh, witnessed with, again, some horror, uh, the acquittal of the officer who uh, murdered Philando Castile in front of his family, uh, that uh, it is even more so of a critical moment for us to imagine what does it mean to live as free fathers, um, and what does it mean to free fathers? What does it mean for you and I to take seriously uh, that there is a deep, deep call to the church and to us who are fathers to live freely and to then be intentional about freeing others who are not yet free? And uh, I do believe this is part and parcel of what we are called to do and to be as the church. It is uh, not an addendum or a uh, 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 add on to our faith, but we are called to walk in justice and in mercy and in compassion. We are called to follow the ways of Jesus, and so I uh, am excited to open up this uh, text today and and uh, do a little bit of thinking through the, the sacred text around what does it mean for us to free fathers. Turn with me then to Deuteronomy chapter number 11. We're going to start at verse number 13. Um, it should be on the screen if you don't have a Bible. Uh, if you do have a Bible, it is the fifth book of the uh, Hebrew Scriptures, or uh, as we are commonly referring to the Old Testament. It is the final contribution to the Torah, or the Pentateuch, if you uh, use that word. And it is a, a, a collection of teachings that... Uh, help to make the identity of the children of Israel coming out of bondage grounded in the uh, uh, in the the truths and the commands and the covenant of the God who brought them out of bondage and uh, this is uh, largely considered to be a collection of teachings uh, of Moses of some of the oral traditions that uh, have been captured and gathered and maintained. Um, because how many of you know, if we don't continue to tell the story of not only our struggle, our liberation, but of God's calling on our life, we can easily be seduced into somebody else's program. I love uh, one of the rabbis, uh, we were talking one time, and, and they mentioned, they said uh, that one of the old uh, midrash uh, or, or collection of teachings for the rabbis, they commanded their children uh, or their, their parents to teach their children the ways and the history of their journey so their children will believe they are the first generation that came out of Egypt. And I thought that was fascinating, right? This idea that you and I have a particular call to make every effort to remind not only ourselves but our children of this great promise, covenant, and journey and how we are to live in the days to follow. Deuteronomy chapter number 11 then, we'll start at verse number 13. Let's see how the Word of God challenges us today for this message of free fathers. Verse number 13, if you will only heed 
God's every commandment that I am commanding you today. Loving the Lord your God, serving God with all your heart and with all your soul, then God will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, and you will gather in your grain, your wine, and your oil. Verse 15, and God will give grass in your fields for your livestock, and you will eat your fill. Verse 16, take care or you will be seduced into turning away, serving other gods and worshiping them. For then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and God will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit. Then you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is given you. Verse number 18, and you shall put these words of mine in your heart and soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you are at home and when you are away when you lie down and when you rise, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. Uh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk again from a simple topic of free fathers. Bow your heads with me and let us ask the presence of God to be here with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we once again want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for the word of God. That is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you that you continue to remind us of all the many ways that you are not only at work, but still calling us into covenant responsibility. I pray that you will bless me as I stand to preach and teach your word. I pray that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. And may it rest upon the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Everybody say free. free. Fathers. Now, uh, I am particularly uh, impressed to encourage us this morning, given all of the conflating tragedies and challenges that bombard our daily reality, and may I uh, even say this age and this season, uh, is reminding us of the many ways that fathers, that men, are not only under attack, but unfortunately often the source of those attacks as well. It is not lost upon me, and nor should it be lost upon you, that uh, there are many, many incidents that have happened in this last week that have certainly in one way or another caused many, many folk to ask, God, are you absent? I uh, certainly am uh, in the work of ministry and justice that we do around peacemaking and much more attuned and in tune, unfortunately, or maybe it is fortunately, but sometimes it can become certainly a lot to just constantly be tracking the amount of men who are constantly being lost daily to violence. And as I track and am attuned to this, I often am aware that those loved ones, our loved ones caught in these cycles, are somebody's son, somebody's father, somebody's brother, somebody's family member and or relative. Uh, I, I certainly know that for many of us, this shooting with the uh, 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 individual uh, unleashing loads of bullets against uh, Republicans, quote unquote, this uh, week who were practicing for a charity uh, baseball game was 
uh, another national disruption in many people's lives. And, and certainly I say national because uh, it's true that some folk who get shot disrupt the national conversation. While some of us who get shot, uh, you know, literally people say, well, uh, that's supposed to happen there, but it's not supposed to happen on a playing field where elected officials play, but when it happens on a playing field where children of color are playing, well, you know, let's shed a tear or two, but get back to our regularly scheduled program. But, and yet still, I was watching the news. I was in New York at the police conference, a, a police conference and our violence prevention conference that uh, many of us uh, are helping to champion a scale up all across the country. And so I was uh, waking up in my hotel. Uh, I unfortunately, you know, uh, when I travel, I get to sleep with the TV on all night. Amen. Because no one's telling me to turn it off. Praise God. Amen. So, you know, sometimes just you try to get in, you know, a little bit ahead. No, I'm just playing. Um, so I, I, I woke up to the news. And, and as I was watching and listening at the way in which they were describing the uh, uh, accused assailant, the first thing that struck me was that he was someone's husband and father. And certainly everyone started to move quickly to the political climate of the day and tried to blame it on that. Uh, but, you know, in my mind, because I and we work in this peacemaking stuff so much, I realized that this husband and father, uh, you know, was not necessarily just driven by the political climate, but one could argue that he and all of us are deeply bathed and overwhelmed by a violent culture that often unleashes violence within husbands and fathers. And so I was sitting there and I was deeply just, you know, just, just trying to struggle with, with that. And, and, and then, you know, the, the Cosby trial has been happening all week and, and I've been trying to ignore that because, you know, I have some cognitive dissonance in my mind, right, of, 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 of Cliff Huxtable and Bill Cosby. And I can't separate them as easily as I would like knowing all the things we know about how uh, folks are easily targeted and, and disproportionately treated, and yet I'm still tormented and tor tortured by Bill Cosby's own confession of what he did to 60 women, drugging them and engaging in advances that were unsolicited, and then, of course, Philando Castile's killing and the, the acquittal of the officer, a Latino police officer who was in fear for his life, so much so that he shot into a car of a father with his child and his partner in the car while he's in a seatbelt and killed him on video and no charges. Then I was saying, Lord have mercy, two years ago, I can't forget the Charleston Nine. And all of these loved ones who were ambushed in their church while praying. And so as I think about the many different ways that Fathers and men are both the source and often the victim of violence. I am constantly being reminded that we have a task, brothers in particular, and all of us collectively, to remind ourselves of this trajectory of liberation and freedom that did not just start when we were in slavery, but dare I say, it has been a constant uh, reaching forward since we were created in the image of God. And through points of history have constantly had 
that reaching for our full humanity disrupted by sin, by trauma, by systems and structures, personal vices, behaviors, and all other kinds of factors that as fathers and husbands and men and our larger community, we must make a new commitment. Dare I say, for some of us, renew our current commitment to live as free in a world intent on keeping us in bondage. Now, it is also not lost on me that this is the week of Juneteenth. Juneteenth, for many of us uh, who have a little bit of a sense of, of history, appreciate that this is Freedom Day in the history of the ancestors of black folk, African slaves in the United States of America. All y'all that don't come from that particular direct history of enslavement may not know that on June 19th in Texas, the, the 1865, the announcement of the abolition of slavery was first made. And ever since then, there's been this consistent memory and celebration of the Declaration of Freedom and Liberation for the enslaved African lost in America. That's just a quote from the great Elaine Brown of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. <laughs> Amen. And so I, I bundle all of this stuff in together because I want you to appreciate that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And yet we live in a reality where a world is not interested in your freedom. Not interested, devoted, and committed to you as a father and as a man, regardless of your race, regardless of your nation of origin, regardless of how many kids you have or don't have, there is an assault on your ability to be free. And so the, what is the cause and the, the case that you and I must daily take up in a world that profits off our bondage, that politicizes our trauma, that feeds the worst parts of ourselves so we can continue to be enslaved to our passions, to our vices, to uh, oppression and systemic and structural discrimination and bias. All of these things, when I talk to some fellas, they often start with a question. I don't know if it's because they know I'm a preacher or not. Maybe this is how a lot of fellas talk when you know we get down to the serious matters. But there is always a conversation about what are we supposed to do in this moment? And where is God? Is God real? If God was real, why does God allow this to keep happening to us. And what is my role as a man who continues to see my children and my family and the women in my life and the community I reside in consistently under salt? I want to say to you that you and I cannot lose hope, nor can we live in ways that produce hopelessness. That we have to make a decision. We have to bind our hearts and our mind and our spirit to the, 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 the eternal commitment and struggle of the God who created us and we who worship our God to live in a state where we can demonstrate our freedom even while we are not yet free. I love Nelson Mandela. He wrote... Uh, this, 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 this wonderful uh, quote, uh, I think I have it up there, it says that the truth is that we are not yet free. We have merely achieved the freedom to be free, the right not to be oppressed. We have not taken the final step of our journey, 
But the first step on a longer and even more difficult road for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. And I want you to appreciate, dear loved ones, that you and I must make every effort to live our lives not only free, but not reinscribing that which takes other people's freedom away as well. Yeah, yeah. You see, there's this kind of pathology, I believe, in our culture today where people become so radically individualized where we think that my freedom should trump your freedoms. And there's a battle and a war for freedom. But how many of you know, if you, uh, if you take uh, uh, Augustine seriously, and I like to take him seriously, you know, he's a good old school African church father, a man who kind of pretty much helped construct the whole theological framework of Christian faith. So, you know, I know some of y'all think you're smart, but I don't know if what you're thinking about is going to last, you know, a couple thousand years from, from now. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, amen. They like, he wasn't the only one, but I mean, give your neighbor a high five and tell him he got some staying power, amen? And, and so, you know, there is something to this idea that to be free is not just to have the ability to make any decision, but to be free is to make the right decision every time. Hmm. Some of us feel like, I'm free, so I just do whatever I want to do. No. Because, you know, what you want to do sometimes is why you always in bondage. I wish I had a church up in here today. But how many of you know we are free when we choose right every time? And part of why we need God and the spirit of God at work in our life is because God through God's spirit helps us lean in the right direction every time. Now it's clear to me, it's clear to me that some of us who got the spirit aren't leaning in the right direction every time. I know I, I, there's some days, amen, happened a few times this morning, this week, yesterday, last week, <laughs> touch your name, amen, where I heard the spirit helping me to lean, telling me to lean, dragging me to lean. Do I have an honest church in here today? Amen. How many know the problem is not with the spirit? The problem is often with us. Why? Because we are not yet free. Thus, Deuteronomy is an important passage of scripture because it is a historical record of what you and I have been joined into maybe not even joined, continued. We are people of the covenant, people of the book. Don't let nobody make you think that Africans were not a part of the Jewish-Israeli cultural context. I remember when I was in Palestine, amen, and, 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 and we were walking through the holy city, and there were uh, Palestinians uh, who, 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 who were just as dark-skinned as me. And they had this great picture of Israel that they said was Africa. <laughs> I said, the Palestinian was like, I know you Americans, you, you have your maps. <laughs> this is what he told me. I know you have your maps. He said, but this is our map. He said, and, you know, I and we don't see a difference between the land where Jesus walked and the land where our ancestors walked and lived. And the land you are on today is African land. I said, touch your neighbor. So some would try to tell you, oh, you following that, that, that oppressor's book and that oppressor's text. And I usually tell them that's because you don't know your history. Praise God. Mm. But I'm not here to talk about that today. 
But I just freed some of your minds, amen. And how I many know if you free your mind, I think the sister said, the rest will follow. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them I'm free today. How then does the text in Deuteronomy call you and I to live? The first thing I think the scriptures lift up for us is that if you and I are free fathers, we will remember God. Verse number 18. I love it. In, in verse number 18, he says, or the text says, put these words of mine in your heart and your soul. Now, it's clear to me that there are many factors that are causing the hearts of men particularly to walk away from God. To become agnostic and atheistic in our ways and our being. I grew up in a time, particularly in our church, where it was not a strange thing to see men lifting up their hands, speaking in tongues, running and shouting, swinging from the chandeliers, doing all these things that are now considered to be things only women do. Mm -hmm. That masculinity seems to have been hijacked by thuggery. Masculinity seems to have been hijacked by this kind of uh, uh, hardness and a closed off sense to the supernatural act of God. And thus when you close off your heart to the transcendent God, you forget the God that brought you out of bondage. Because I want to let you know something, brothers. If God is like you, and if the only power God has is your power, we in trouble. We in trouble. You and I as men must open ourselves up to a God and an activity of God that is not uh, essentialized in the actions of the men you know. Now what's at stake here, fathers? Well, it is indeed a fact because of colonialization and white supremacy that God in the minds of the large swaths of our culture is a old white man. When you say God, most people's mind goes to an old white man. Now there's a reason why most men, including white men, don't like God. If God is an old white man. I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. Because God, first of all, <laughs> How many know God's not white? How many know God's not a man? How many know God's not human? So anytime we try to describe God with human language, we already reduce God to that which is incapable of handling the worst and best conditions of our lives. Again, what's at stake? What's at stake? Well, what's at stake is if you do not remember rightly who God is, we will assign to God that which we have assigned to the fallen, broken men in our lives. So your notion of fatherhood will be bound up in a literal Old white man. And how many know that's a problem? That's a problem. I'm not hating on no old white men. But how many of you know there's nothing perfect or great about being an old white man? Or a young black man. Or a woman, 
or queer, or whatever you want to describe yourself in human terms, if that is how you think the God of all creation and the God of the universe, the uncreated one, can be described through these anthropomorphic terms that are radically reduced, then your God is too small. And you will walk away from that God. But when the scripture says for you and I, listen, to woo, get a tattoo, if you will. <laughs> Put these words in your heart. Listen, bind them as a sign on your head. Fix it as an emblem on your forehead. What does that mean? You got to scribe these truths. Braid them into your psyche. Put them on display in your life. Why? So whenever you forget, you just look at what is tattooed on your heart, tattooed in your mind, that the God I serve is not someone who looks like you or me, someone who's limited like you or like me, but I remember that the God I serve is the one that brought me out. The one that healed me. The one that delivered me. The one that helped me. And if I can remember that God, then I can live my life in service to that God, listen brothers, who will help you then become the father, the husband, the mentor, the life giver you are called to be through the power of that God's spirit. What are some questions that you need to think about? Well, the first thing, what circumstances are making it difficult to remember that God is still with you and us? It is indeed the case that all of these assaults on our being, trauma, anger, fear, pain, toxic masculinity, abuse, all these things are literally erasers that are trying to erase God from your memory and put in place a false notion of yourself and the one who created you. What then must you tattoo on your heart, your soul, so you can pass down this rightly remembered God to your children? Somebody holler, remember God, remember God. The second thing, the second thing that that I think the scripture lifts up for us today is that if we are free fathers, we will break cycles. Somebody holler, break some cycles. Now, 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 I I, I took a little liberties today because I I was just continuing to wrestle with a, a couple questions that I've got text and tweeted and, and cornered on planes, trains, automobiles. I was in four or five different cities all in the last two weeks and at least one or two conversations in each one of those places were asking me questions about the cycles of abuse and addiction and trauma that is often passed down by fathers and husbands and men. And again, I believe we must collapse the false distinction between a victim and a perpetrator. Because I have found that the perpetrator at some point in their life has been victimized by someone who has not dealt with their own stuff. So fathers, one of the great questions you and I must wrestle with is what cycles must we break if we are going to be free and live in a way that frees others. Lamentations 5 verse 7 says, Our fathers sinned, and it is we who have borne their iniquities. If I were to read a few other passages in the Torah and the Pentateuch in the first five books, the scripture talks about that the sins of the fathers can be visited to the sons and the daughters across seven generations. Fathers, there's a lot at stake. If you have abuse going in your family and you don't break the cycle of abuse, 
You are unleashing hell in your legacy and family. Oh, my temper's too this. Go to an anger management class. Oh, I like to puff, puff, and pass. Well, if you're spending your rent money, your kids' tuition, your grocery money, because you like to puff, puff, pass, and drink the Cavassier. <laughs> How many of you know that that is not recreational usage? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I grew up in holiness where we weren't supposed to touch not, taste not, drink not. Don't look at that and you just walk around like this. Because <laughs> we wanted to be holy so bad. I know, you know, folk, you know, ain't, ain't in the holiness like that. I still am most of the time. Amen. Praise God. It would be good for you to know your history. My father sat down with all my brothers and he told us alcoholism is a huge vice in the McBride men's history. That's why I don't drink. Now, of course, I grew up not drinking because, you know, I thought Jesus was coming back and I was just afraid. <laughs> that that first drink, the clouds would crack open and I'd just be left behind. Because I tried to taste the devil's nectar. Touch your neighbor somebody. <laughs> there may still be a little bit of that deep, deep down in my psyche somewhere. But I also have a fear of becoming an alcoholic. So I, why, why would I, that I, you know, some folks say, oh, Pastor Mike, we should go skydiving. I'm like, well, there's a lot of ways for a brother like me to die. <laughs> One of them will not be hopping out of a plane. Touch your neighbor, right? If I know that my genetic or historical predisposition is alcoholism. Why would I model any kind of engagement of that and put my wife or my daughters at risk? <laughs> Brothers, I'm talking to you now because yours may not be alcohol. I'm not hating on you drinking alcohol necessarily, although all the research tells us that the overwhelming majority of domestic violence happens when, I was about to say another word, brothers is drunk. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. So at the very least, brothers, we have to curb our appetites through the power of the rightly remembered God. Hmm? To make sure that if there's abuse and addiction and trauma in you, you know your story. If you don't know your story, start to make up one. That you can tell your children. My father sat us down. We had sexual abuse in our family history. So my dad let us know about that. So we wouldn't be caught in a situation wondering where these urges and feelings are coming from and be so surprised or ashamed that we couldn't do what was necessary yeah, yeah. to make sure we don't do harm yeah. to the people we are called to love and nurture. Yeah. We have an anger problem. Right. And even though I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and that with fire, there's some moments, some things that'll push me beyond where I am comfortable being. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's just what I and we in our family had to deal with to break these cycles so the sins of our fathers aren't visited to our children. Now this is important because there is an anger bubbling up in the land. 
about all this injustice. And some days I ask God, can I be Nat Turner? Can I lead a violent rebellion? Because I think I'd be a good one. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Y'all better pray for your pastor. Because some days I'd be like, rebel, just give me something, anything. And I think some folk will follow me. Touch your neighbor, somebody. How many days that anger bubbling up in the land? And you and I have to figure out how do we not allow the violence that has been visited upon us? I love how Franz Fanon talks about how violence perpetrated to us through the colonizer. It is only a human response then to return that violence to others. That literally when you have been victimized by violence, the natural response is to then be violent. Franz Fanon, now y'all should read him, he, he, you know, he got a little something to say. But that's why we also need supernatural power to help trump the things in our lives that will cause the violence to be visited even to our children. I, we, men, we need to resist these moments. We need to be on the front lines of Providing for our families, fighting for justice, dismantling the systemic and structural bias that's there. And we must realize that how we resist and how we show up, how we break these cycles of personal and systemic and structural evil is important as well. So what are some questions around this that that I want you to consider this morning. What cycles need to be broken in your family? Brothers, I, I need you to sit down, maybe not with your partner yet, because some of us need to go to some therapy and get some healing done, or sit down with your, with your, with your, your elder in your family and do some excavation of these sins that are bubbling up in your family. So you can rewrite a new story. Yeah, yeah. Just because you give your life to Jesus don't mean that all of your history drops off a cliff. God don't remember your sins no more, that's for sure. But your history, your history is still something you must wrestle with every day and choose to break cycles. What are the cycles you and I must break as men? Fathers as partners. I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect father. I'm a workaholic. I, but I thank God that I'm not bound by alcoholism. I don't hit my wife. I do everything I can to wake up every day and sometimes night and go to work. <laughs> and these other vices that I got to work on, Thank God my wife, she's going to hang out with me for a little while longer. <laughs> Believe I run on, see what the end is going to be. Ain't they all saying you say that? Yeah. Brothers, we got to be honest about ourselves if we're going to be free. Now, we can, we, 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 we can walk around here and, 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 and think we free and live in bondage. Right. Or we can wrestle every day with what it means to be free. Are there abuses, addictions, regrets which you must end with this generation of parenting? Oh, my time is moving quick. Let me give you these last two things that free fathers do. Free fathers bring their families to God. Amen. Verse 19, teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home when you are away, when you lie down, and when you rise. <clears throat> the first teacher about the rightly remembered God should be you as a father and a husband and a, and a, 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 a caregiver. <clears throat> Don't you know 
know how powerful it is when men help model submission to God? I know we live in a time where everybody want to, you know, feel like they are God, but we are seeing a real life expression of what an unaccountable man with too much power looks like. And I know it's scaring the heaven and the hell out of a whole lot of y'all out here. Because the irrationality of leadership, the insecurity, always feeling like you are under attack. You, 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 I, I was watching uh, Andre Ward get his victory last night. Sorry that I still watch the brutal sport of boxing, amen. Andre Ward gave his fellow a right hook that I think turned him all the way around. And I think that brother had a metanoia experience up in that ring. And after he got hit, he was shook. And he saw punches that were not coming. He was, oh my goodness. How many know when you are an unaccountable man, you take everything as an attack? Even that which is meant to help you. You and I can't be, we can't lead our families being unaccountable to God, to our families, to our loved ones. That's a shipwreck waiting to happen. And if you are in any way afraid for how this terrible, unaccountable leader is leading our country, and you have tendencies, though smaller, like that terrible leader. You ought to be terribly afraid how you lead your family then. Right. Right. Who would want to follow someone who can't never be wrong? Right. Right. Who can't ever say they sorry? Right. Who thinks that their word is the final authority and you change your word every day? It's like, what are we talking about? When you bring your family to God, you have to bring your family to God through a consistency right. of prayer. Right. Ball game. Show up to their places. Do what is consistent so they can see God in you. And then you must consistently remind them that I am not he. Right. Not even he. I am not God. Because remember, God's not a man. That's right. That's right. I am not God. I am simply a reflection of God's image as you are. And I'm here to help you get rightly remembered. I'm teaching you. I'm talking to you about God. Yeah. Whether we're in the house or in the streets. Right. On the job or in the school. I'm showing you what it means to follow God. You're a free man. You're a free father when you can teach your children and your mentees and those around you the rightly remembered God. You're free. If you can't teach others about God, I want to submit to you there's some bondage there. Maybe bondage of ignorance, bondage of pride, bondage of unaccountability. But the man who can submit themselves before God and train their whole person to follow God, you're going to be some kind of man. You're going to be some kind of father. You're going to be some kind of husband. You're going to be some kind of leader. The last thing, a free man, a free Father stands in the gap. The prophet Ezekiel said that God was looking for someone and anyone 
who would build up the wall and stand in the gap on behalf of the land. There's a great theological concept in the scriptures called the kinsman redeemer. And the kinsman redeemer, Lord, if I had an old school church, I'd preach on the kinsman redeemer for these last 10 minutes. The kinsman redeemer was a male relative who, according to the Torah, had the privilege and the responsibility. Think about this. You got a privilege and a responsibility. Ain't that something that how you use your privilege is also a responsibility. You are responsible for how you use your privilege of being a man in a patriarchal society. You ain't walking around here, I'm a man. Well, everybody knows that. So what? What does that mean? What does that mean? That you got access to power you did not earn. You just gonna throw it around? You just gonna throw it around? No, you have a responsibility to bring your privilege into submission to the rightly remembered God. If you're gonna be free, to be a kinsman redeemer, kinsman redeemer, privilege, responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble, danger, or need. The kinsman redeemer was designated to be the one to jump to the rescue or the delivery of one who was made vulnerable by life's circumstances. The kinsman redeemer had an obligation to redeem the land, had an obligation to redeem the enslaved, had an obligation to provide stability. It says in air, that meant really, literally, because some of y'all may just run away with that one, you know, because literally it means that if, if in your family unit the husband of the woman died and there was no heir, the kinsman redeemer had a privilege and responsibility to provide a male heir so the mother would not be left vulnerable to the system. Or the, or, the, or, the, or the cultural conditions. Don't you know in that patriarchal agricultural society that if there was no male there, the women were then often left to prostitution to take care of their families. Or depending on the institution of the temple to take care of the welfare system and or having to use their bodies. The kingdom of Redeemer was, was positioned to guard against the continued vulnerability of the women in their family network. The kinsman redeemer is someone who is willing to stand in the gap beyond your own nuclear or radical individualized family unit. That when you follow Jesus, I want you to know that you have a new family that is not defined by race, that is not defined by your last name, it's not defined by your nation of origin, not defined by these socially constructed identities. When you are baptized in the family of Jesus, brothers, listen, we are being called to stand in the gap. You and I are free when we can use our freedom to help free others. I'm out of time. Stand with me, everyone. Stand with me.